afternoon for part two of this three-part webinar series, very kindly hosted by Satarla on responsible mining and sourcing of materials. My name is Amon Chandel, and I am head of events and also look after conference partnerships at WIM UK. You may also know me from the Oxford Mining Club and the Natural Resources Forum. So a big welcome to all of you wherever you are dialing in from. I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping points. If you could be so kind to keep your mics on mute, that would be greatly appreciated. You will see your cameras have been turned off as we are following a traditional webinar format. And please direct all your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We are recording today's webinar, so please feel free to check back in a couple of days for the link. So to start us off, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Sarah Gordon. Having completed her PhD at Imperial College, Sarah then went on to work as a geologist for Anglo-American. She was lucky enough to live and work in Canada, Brazil, Southern Africa, and Europe in a variety of functions from exploration through to sustainability, risk management, and assurance. This grounding allowed her to explore different risk management techniques and uses, applying them to real situations. Sarah co-founded Satarla in 2014, and now with 80 associates based around the world in offices in London, Sydney, Johannesburg, and Toronto, Satarla provides risk management consultancy, training, and research to organizations from sectors such as healthcare, agriculture, charities, finance, together with petrochemicals, energy, oil and gas, and of course, mining. Sarah is an honorary lecturer at Imperial College London and a research associate at the University of Johannesburg. Voted as one of the 100 Global Inspirational Women in Mining in the 2016 edition of WIM 100, she is also a trustee of Geology for Global Development. Joining us today on our panel, we also welcome Monica Ospina, Monica is a corporate social responsibility and sustainability expert with recognized experience in the design and implementation of CSR strategies that support operational productivity while building trusting relationships with communities impacted by mineral exploration and mining operations. Her expertise in transforming conflict into development and human and social capital into value for investors has contributed to ensuring operational readiness, improving the perception of mining and the well-being of communities across regions. As an author, Monica created the Local Community Procurement Program, a sustainable supply chain model awarded by the IFC World Bank in 2012. She, also, she has also contributed to the IFC World Bank's Guide for Early Stakeholder Engagement published in 2015 and participated in discussion, discussion groups for the Sustainable Development Goals at the Rio Plus 20 World Convention on Sustainable Development in 2012. Whew. In 2020, she was awarded as Distinguished Lecturer by the Canadian Institute of Mining. Monica is founder and director at OTRAE. Delighted to have you both today with, at our webinar. So to start us off, I would like to hand over to Sarah. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much, Imone, and congratulations on getting through our biographies like that. So you are a true expert when this comes to this, and you're going to be even better when we get through the end of next week's webinar as well. Um, <laughs> So hello everybody and thank you very much for, for dialing into today's session. Um, as you can see by the screen in front of you, um, today what we're going to talk about is responsible mining and sourcing of materials. And whilst I'm unfortunately going to hog most of the time, Monica is going to be absolutely brilliant and actually tell us how it is when you actually try and get responsibility and also engagement on the social side to actually work on the ground. Now, before we start properly, um, there was a little challenge that everybody was invited to take part in. And this is a technique that we would welcome those of you who are sitting there watching the call here today to think about doing whilst we go through the presentation and then email all of your lovely pictures to us as we go. So one of the, the techniques that you can use when you're trying to understand how somebody else perceives a mine 
is to ask them to draw it. And actually quite a lot of research has been done into this and it's absolutely fascinating when you see how, say, an engineer perceives a mine um, versus a four-year-old, for example. So Monica, I don't know how old um, the little person that came to say, say hello to the camera is just now, but I suspect that they have a very different perspective of what a mine is. Usually it's along the lines of, Minecraft um, compared to what you or I might think a mine is. So ladies and gentlemen, your challenge is to multitask whilst you're listening to today's webinar and just finding a scrap piece of paper is to draw what you think a mine looks like and then email that picture through to rose at satala.com and then Rose will be able to upload all of those pictures together and we can use that in our closeout discussion in approximately 45 minutes time. So to reiterate your challenge ladies and gentlemen is to draw on a piece of paper what do you think a mine is Take a picture of that and send that picture through to Rose so we can use that in a closeout discussion in approximately 45 minutes time. Now, this isn't the first time that we've run this particular challenge. We also ran it during a conference that we ran um, a few months ago on responsible raw materials. Um, and again, in case you decide that Monica and I are truly boring today and you want something else to keep you entertained, there's lots of fantastic little 10 minute talks that are up there on the responsible raw materials website that will give you a much broader base and insight into what responsible mining and sourcing of materials really is. So feel free to go and check out that website as well. So lots to keep you entertained. However, with regards to today um, and what do we mean by responsible mining and sourcing of materials? Well, first of all, we have to think about the future. So what do we think the future is going to look like? It might look like one of these dust laden and gas laden cities or for example it might be a beautiful green planet we just don't know but what we do know is that unless something dramatic happens much more dramatic than COVID-19 is that by 2050 it is estimated that will be approximately 9.8 billion people on our planet and every single one of those people is moving forwards in terms of the level of development. Now, of course, this can be measured in a whole multitude of different ways, be it economic growth, be it the use of the internet. And I have to say, it would be fascinating redoing all of these statistics now, given that we are somewhere within COVID-19 versus what the world looked like before that. So the world is changing and people on our planet are, of course, changing with it. And as we change, the types of commodities and the materials that we feel we need in everyday life also changes. So of course, we've got some commodities that are incredibly basic, might be the early stage commodities. And then we've got those commodities that, to be honest, we don't really need it unless we are living a slightly more luxurious lifestyle. Now, that is a case there of the more developed we are perhaps the more complicated the different commodities are that we need and to take a look at some of those i'm now going to unashamedly steal some of the icmm different um, diagrams for example they put together so when we look at all of those different materials that we need in something like a mobile phone as we can see there's all kinds of wonderful elements within the periodic table that we need to be able to pull together and the same thing can be said for a car, be it an electric vehicle or be it a non-renewable fossil fuel driven car. So we need all kinds of different materials and also things like wind turbines. These are not simple pieces of technology. We need all kinds of different materials to be drawn together to allow us to build this equipment and use this equipment. And much of this, of course, at the moment is very much anchored in our energy transition. If we're to be able to move away from fossil fuel into more renewable forms of energy, we need to mine a huge volume of very, very specialist different commodities from out of the ground in order to be able to construct and build those wind turbines, those electric batteries, etc. Now, of course, many of us will have heard lots about the circular economy. And the key thing about the circular economy is that it's not actually truly circular. 
Okay, so there is lots of recycling, okay, and repurposing that we can do of materials, which is absolutely brilliant. And there's a huge amount more that we need to be doing about this. But we cannot recycle everything because we just don't have the technical ability to do so at the moment. And also because the world's population is increasing and because our demand for different commodities is changing, we constantly need to feed this circular economy. So we're not going to get to the point anytime soon where we don't need to dig materials out of the ground. We're still at a point in time currently where we need to dig lots of materials, lots of raw materials out of the ground in order to serve our needs as human beings. Now we can either um, present the circular economy in a fairly simple format um, such as this one here. And um, as you can see, EIT, the Raw Materials Group within Europe, they do some fantastic work looking at the circular economy. But there are many other different groups that look at the circular economy as well, such as the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where as you can see, they're beginning to make it a bit more complicated. They're beginning to take into scope some slightly different aspects of what can we actually do to make sure that we make the best use of all of those materials that we either mine out of the ground or perhaps we grow. So how do we make best use of all of those materials? And this is great because the better we can get at understanding where all these materials come from, the more responsible we can be in terms of sourcing those materials, which in turn actually then applies more pressure on those who do the providing of those materials to make sure that the miners, for example, do it in the best possible way. And also those who are doing it in the best possible way get rewarded for all of that hard work, for trying to aim and trying to actually be responsible in the mining of those materials. So as consumers, we're becoming increasingly aware of the provenance of where those raw materials come from. And we've seen this for many, many years, fair trade bananas through to fair trade chocolates. This has been around for a long time. And what we're seeing really now is the, the grounding of us being able to say, but, but where does our cobalt come from? Because without cobalt, we don't have one of these. We need cobalt in those lithium batteries, for example, in order to make them work. So where do all of those bits and pieces come from? So as consumers, we're beginning to get much more savvy with regards to where do those materials come from. But it's not just us as consumers. It's also the investors and the insurers and the regulators. And especially over the last 12 months, we've seen a massive uptick in terms of a lot of chatter and also a lot of energy going into ESG integration into how investors actually make decisions with regards to where they best invest money. Now, you're going to hear Monica and I talk a lot about this thing called ESG. Now, I have sat on panels over the last year with people using different words to interpret what ESG means. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your first piece of interaction if you're not already drawing your mind on a piece of paper. And your challenge, ladies and gentlemen, is to pick up your phone, which of course has some cobalt, most likely from the DRC within it, um, and to go to menti.com. Okay, just like that. And when you go to menti.com, it will ask you to type in a code, which is 527546. And within there, it will ask you to define what does ESG actually mean. Now, you can either tell us what E, S and G stand for, or in your own words, what do you think ESG is actually all about? I.e., is it just about sustainability? Is it about that corporate social responsibility? What do you think that means? Now, in case you missed the link and you missed the code, I know that Rose will be putting these into the chat for you. So you will be able to create a word cloud with regards to what ESG means. And Monica and I will come back to that later. So on your phones, go to menti.com. It's all on the screen in front of you and use the code 527546. And you should be able to enter into the word cloud what you think ESG stands for. Now, whilst you're all doing that, I'm actually going to give you the answer. 
So therefore, this piece of interaction is, um, is, is, is slightly flawed, isn't it, Monica? Um, Monica's laughing at me, which is always good. So ESG usually stands for environment, social and governance. OK, that's what it usually stands for. And as you can see, we've depicted this by using a three strand rope because you cannot do ESG properly without all three of those component parts. Quite often, organizations try to break them down into individual pillars, and that becomes really difficult because you suddenly realize there's an awful lot of overlap between the three of them. And also, as soon as you break them down into pillars, you also then begin to miss stuff. So things like health and safety suddenly disappears off the table because it doesn't fit so naturally into the E, the S, or the G, but it's vitally important in this ESG world. Now, in terms of what do we mean in more depth about the ESG, on the environmental side, this generally includes everything from land use through to biodiversity, nature and conservation, waste. So what do we do with stuff that we're not using, say, from a mining perspective? It includes noise, visual, vibration, etc. So things that might impact on what's going on in the environment. The, the use and the protection of water, so both in terms of the quality of that water, but also how much water is there, if there's too much or too little for what you're trying to do, but what about the community round about your particular asset? Um, we can also look at site access, so even just trying to get to the place where you're working will usually involve some sort of disruption of the environment round about where you happen to be working. Environment also talks to things like rehabilitation and closure of those particular sites, as well as really, really big factors such as climate change, all the way through to making sure that you get your environmental permits. So those might be some of the things that we consider when we start to talk about the environmental space. Now, when we come onto the social space, and Monica will recognize this picture, because you'll see that Monica is standing there in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> and she's laughing at me again. So in the social space, and Monica is the true expert with regards to this, in the social space, we can include everything, again, including things like access to our sites, again, including things like permits. But we're also talking about what are the expectations set by that local community, and we can address them in part by things like local hiring, local procurement. We really need to understand the social context and the complexity of things like the social context. And within social, there's a huge amount of stakeholder engagement, and also trying to understand what could the impacts be on the social side of things. And then finally, in the governance space, this is where we're talking about both corporate governance, so what's going on within an organization, and that might be at board level or at management or all the way through the organization. From a governance perspective, again, there's an awful lot of stakeholder engagement, as well as trying to ascertain how on earth do we get those permits. We're also talking about things like business ethics and tax transparency. So are we truly paying all of the taxes that we need to pay in that particular jurisdiction? Um, and of course, there's that interface with compliance. But finally, on the governance side, we're not just talking about the governance within a company. We're also talking about where in the world is that organization actually operating? So what about the government of that country? What about the different regulatory bodies that might be there to provide oversight or provide guidance as to those rules and regulations that you as an organization may want to operate within? So that's a very quick overview of the normal things that get incorporated within the E, so the environmental side, the social or the S side of things, and the G or the governance side of things. And as you can see, even at that very macro level, you've got that interlinking between all three of the ESG factors. So what does ESG look like within mining? Well, it's, it's always been there, okay? This is nothing new in the mining world, the only thing that's changed is it's perhaps being elevated in terms of its importance. The vast majority of mining projects tend to fail because they're not doing well enough on the ESG side of things. As a geologist, of course, I would love to believe that it was all to do with the rocks 
and whether there's actually an ore body in the ground. But once you've found those rocks or once you suspect there might be something there, the next thing that tends to scupper you really comes in on that environment, social governance side of things with the vast majority of projects failing or being significantly delayed because the ESG risks were not anticipated or prioritised or focused on to the degree with which they needed to be. Now, the interesting thing with regards to this is that increasingly, if you're not doing your ESG correctly, you won't be getting the finance to actually be able to push that project forwards. In the past, you could probably still get the finance anyway, because you'd be able to sort out the ESG further down the road. But what we're seeing now is that people have realized that actually, if you're not thinking about those social factors right at the very start of a mining project, actually you're teeing yourself up for failure. And you might not fail in the next 10 years, you'll probably fail in the next 30 years. And that scale of failure, of course, gets bigger and bigger. Now, with regards to this background to mining, um, anybody who missed last week's session, I encourage you to go and check out the video from last week's webinar, where we walked through this fact sheet that you can see on the screen. And this is all freely available um, on the various different websites for you to go and look at, um, where we walked through, okay, what are the basic steps within mining from a technical perspective? So when all those geologists and engineers are talking about mining and those different stages, what are they really meaning? And just to try and summarize some of that, of course, we start off the mining life cycle generally with some exploration. We then go into a project phase where we build the mine. We then operate the mine. So that's where we're digging all of that lovely rock out of the ground um, and we're processing it. And then finally, of course, we need to close that asset because every mining project is indeed a, pro a project. So it will come to an end at some point in time. Yes, of course, we can do other things with it, but in terms of that primary purpose of that particular asset, in terms of being a mine of non-renewable resources, we need to be able to plan and to deliver on closure at the end of the life of that mine. Now, of course, the different ways in which we can explore or we can look at those different assets when we are starting off with a blank sheet of paper, there's lots of different options with regards to how we might be able to mine that particular asset. And one of the key things that changes as we go through that is a narrowing in terms of our decision on how we are actually going to mine. Another thing that changes is who owns that particular project. And that ownership tends to change as we go through the life cycle of that mine. Now, while some of the largest companies do, of course, do exploration, actually what you tend to find is it's lots and lots and lots of little companies do that initial prospecting, and they have an aim of selling to a small mining company who have the aim of selling to a larger mining company and so on. And the key thing there is that the focus points for those prospectors is usually to sell something which is just actually a sheet of paper. There's nothing necessarily being dug out of the ground at that point in time. That's what they're aiming for. They're definitely not aiming for the closure of that asset in a few decades time. And so that therefore means that we have a very, very different mindset, which could be captured by saying, okay, are we looking at the technical side of things? Are we looking at the ESG side of things? Or are we looking at the financial side of things? And what you can see here is that traditionally, the ESG focus doesn't really come in until quite a long way through that mining value chain. And in fact, depending on where you are in the world, you may not need to think about it until actually quite late on in the project phase. And so imagine if there was a showstopper stopper on the social side that you hadn't noticed, you could have spent millions of dollars before somebody actually sits down and properly, properly acknowledges hang on a second, everybody, we have a massive problem on the social side. Or to flip that over, there may be a massive opportunity on the social side that because we're not acknowledging that right at the beginning of that value chain, we actually miss that opportunity. And so therefore we fail to realize on the full value that we could gain from mining that asset with regards to the development of the local community, for example. Now, of course, all of this takes a long, a long time. And depending on which exploration geologist you speak to, some of them will take you that this takes 10 years to get through the initial phase. Many try to say that it takes less time than that. But on average, ladies and gentlemen, it is still 
10 years because usually something will be delayed at some point in time. And the really exciting thing about this is that increasingly, as we go forwards in time, you're beginning to see a balancing of those different factors. You're beginning to see ESG be pulled earlier in that mining life cycle. So no longer can that prospector sell a potential project without beginning to consider those ESG factors because nobody will buy it from them. So you're beginning to see that formalization of ESG much, much earlier on in that mining life cycle compared to what we used to have. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to hand over to the lovely Monica to actually give us an insight as to what does it really look like on the ground from a social perspective because Monica is one of the world's great experts when it comes to the social side of things and actually making it work. So what does it actually look like when we get the social side of things to work on the ground? Monica, over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Sarah. And thank you everybody for joining us. This is, this is great. Uh, it's nothing better than having such a beautiful introduction and actually it was amazing the way you present the ESG piece because regardless that they are together, the ESGs, and regardless that in some mindsets they are separate, but when you go in the field, they are together. You cannot work without another one. You cannot talk about building trust in communities when there is no governance policies around anti-corruption when you cannot even guarantee people that the use of water is what, what it is, the reuse of water and the respect to the environment. So the whole piece, it comes into one, and probably for practicalities and level of expertise, that's how we separate it and divide it. So uh, basically, I would like just to highlight a couple of things here around the social license and building that local support, and what is the value on that in relation to the ESGs. Most of the times, normally people tend to think that in my field is just you go to community and you smile and you just get access. Um, well, it's not like that. It's like uh, you walking on the street and you just smile any guy and you just got married tomorrow. It's not like that. So the point here is that the local support comes in, in, in a way of integrating what is the value for everybody and understanding what is the value. And the value in terms, for the, in terms of community development they are not looking at the, how much money investors put in that. They're looking about how many years it's gonna take for us to be out of poverty and extreme conditions. Is how many years can I have the tranquility of having a stable employment opportunity? Or how many years is gonna be that my region for the first time is gonna live a stability and non-conflict? And we have to be aware before I move forward and uh, in being clear that Unfortunately, mining is happening in, in a part of the world, mostly, that we have failed states, where people don't trust the government because whatever history record had happened, and foreigners for many years, and we kind of start from colonization, had taken advantage of us. So why am I going to trust you? Why? Why if I cannot trust my even, my, even my own people? So the value for community comes from stability comes from the trust and the proven actions on an everyday. And that's when you get the social license. And the social license is just simply uh, how you materialize the trust. For the industry, what does it mean for the industry? For the industry means that working and operating in a non-conflict environment is every day a schedule is happening. Every work plan is happening daily in an organized way that you can plan, monitor, budget, schedule, everything. When you have a conflict environment, when things are not operationally well with social, the industry cannot function. And if the industry cannot function, you cannot offer the security investors want to see the return of investment ahead. So all of these three have very different visions in terms of what is the value for them. But when you put them together, that's what makes a mining operation successful. And I love the fact, Sarah, that you started from exploration. And early engagement and early exploration is very close to my heart as I have been working a lot in research in this field. And everything starts from that. But it doesn't mean that we are going to blame geologists because they did a good job in starting the relation with the community. Sorry. Geologists among all and are 
the most socially sensitive individuals in the industry. Why? They, I always say this the same. They drink the water nobody drinks. They sleep in the places nobody wants to sleep. They get the mosquito bites that everybody in the community gets. They eat the same food the community eat. They are friends of the community because they are the only people they can interact with. That closeness builds a relationship. When is the challenge? The challenge comes when we don't provide the the solid and educated ground for geologists on the social component and the governance component. When organizations just leave one geologist, go to the field and you just get land access and bring samples. Sorry, it doesn't work like that. They can bring amazing and, and their talent will flourish when we create the environment where the community knows what is gonna happen in their territories, when the community and recognize that we respect the land rights. And here we, we move to another discussion with these land rights. And even more if you're talking about indigenous territories. So we provide that. You provide that also that in terms of the governance, the geologist knows that he has, he's working in a company that have a solid framework of anti-corruption practices, no bribing, a good code of ethics and so on. So this guy is equipped by a team outside of the sampling team that when he goes to the field, he enjoys what he does. And what he does best is working with these communities, be humble in sitting and eating and sleeping with them in the same tents and having that brilliant knowledge that in so many cases is transferred to locals. That's when the projects are successful. When the crew working with the geologists go and learn about identifying rocks, learn about sampling, and they walk together back, everybody knows that they are in a safe net. But the safe environment is created by outside. It's created by social science. It's created by governance. And investors can be for sure that this guy go to the field, come back with the samples, and go back to their family. And that's the safety piece that you mentioned, Sarah. And I totally agree with you. Health and safety. It is, I mean, I'm very grateful with health and safety because they paved the road in the 90s for us and somehow. Uh, but right now it's kind of, let's find a way. It is governance, it is governance. It is part of my commitment as an organization to ensure the well-being of people. It's part of social, yes, because it's the life being the, the, the well-being and the livelihood of many people that are part of this project. And it's environmental because every single action will materialize probably in environmental peace. So when we talk about the well-being of not only the geologists and the people working in the company, but being aware to the community around us, we ensure that it's no reason not to have the social license. It is a reason to have a project that brings peace and that's one of the things that I love about mining in terms of the potential it has. And my career is started in research because I've, I was touched by the fact that mining is the only industry that touches the lives of people that are forgotten by their very own governments. So if mining does right, we can lift humanity. And when you talk about the circular economy, it was just an idea came to my mind that I cannot resist the chair is the fact that these communities are users, are consumers of what mining produces. These people go to the doctor and medical equipment and x-rays and, and they jump in a truck and they jump in the bus. And probably we're talking about low income people, but they jump in the bus and they want the tools to do agriculture. So that circular economy makes of the regions where we mine consumers as well. So why don't we invest in the source, in social investment, and make it human and social capital as equally important as any other, in any other area that the, the industry invests, knowing that at one point they're gonna be consumers of the same thing that we mine. So when we understand that that codependency of, of, of human, humanity is just so critical, I think that that ESG has become very easy a question for everybody. And uh, now under the age of COVID, I think that one good thing about COVID is that for the first time in history, all of us feel the fear of the same thing. And it's a tiny thing that 
we go to the supermarket, we put our mask and we don't even know. So that is, that fear is lived in, 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 in communities under stress daily when they live in a conflict zone. It's not COVID what they are fearful. Probably they're fearful of guerrillas, of uh, criminal organizations, or, or even their own government. But they live fear. So now we're why we know what fear looks like, what it feels like. So let's work together to create a non-conflict environment where mining can lift humanity just because we are doing it right. And I truly believe we can do it. I really believe we can do it. So it is a matrimony of science, geoscience and social science, and we can do it fantastically. I saw what I have to say. Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Monica. So, so ladies and gentlemen, as you can see here, Monica knows what it's like. She's spent a huge amount of time working with different communities all around the world um, to actually make sure that this is done in the best possible way. And as Monica says, actually setting up those geologists, for example, to actually be able to do their job properly, um, et cetera. So if you've got questions for Monica, please do feel free to use the Q&A button um, because we will have time for questions at the end. But Monica, also to, to build on what you just said, so this is a case where it can be done, but it is complicated. So as, as soon as you start talking about human beings, we're talking about a complicated system. It's never linear. Um, and that's something which can be, um, be, I guess, sort of shown through even just how we all viewed our different um, governance, social, and well, what do we mean by ESG? So just to share a new screen with you. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the word cloud that you have just put together um, over the course of, of the last 20 minutes or so. And what we can see here are lots of different words coming into being. I suspect that we inadvertently managed to cut off the number of characters you could use. But even, so some people will interpret ESG in very, very different ways from other people. And those perspectives are absolutely vital for us to be able to get to understand, um, and if not be able to address, certainly respect, when we're trying to comprehend what does that social context look like, let alone the governance and the environmental, et cetera, the technical, the financial context of whatever it is that we might be attempting to do. So if I just go back to my slide presentation again, and my mouse has managed to disappear, which is always exciting. Um, this is a case here where in terms of being able to, to measure this, this is a case where, especially if we're trying to compare and contrast different factors, we want to be able to, to measure it. Now, we may not be able to quantify it in hard numbers, but we do need to be able to say if somebody is doing something about right or, or not well enough, or perhaps they're missing some opportunity that's on the table. And as I'm sure many of you are aware, there's a huge number of frameworks, standards, principles, et cetera, that have been released or certainly updated over the last few years and depending on what their focus is different groups tend to focus on different areas and i am fully aware that there are many many different standards frameworks etc that i have not put on this particular list this is just a selection of some of them and the key thing with regards to all of these many different frameworks that all attempt to give us that guidance or at least that structure with regards to esg and sustainability as it might be impacting on whatever it is that we're trying to do or how we might be impacting on it. Um, there are lots of different ways that we can look at it. And many of these standards, as I said, they are being updated. So this is, this is actually from 12 months ago in terms of some of those updates that are expected to come through in the pipeline, many of which we've obviously already seen. And we're seeing new updates come through now. Some organizations have taken advantage of COVID to try and push through updates. Other organizations have taken the opportunity to actually sit and pause and think, hmm, how can we refine our standard or our framework in a better way? Um, and I'm sure that most of us have seen in the news where certainly from a financial standpoint, those organizations that actually put more weighting on ESG actually have come out better with regards to some of those early um, fluctuations with regards to share prices, et cetera, um, in conjunction with COVID-19. Now, the key thing with regards to all of these standards and frameworks, et cetera, is what is the output or the impact questions? You can ask people if they have a human rights policy. You can ask people if they um, monitor the temperature of a furnace, et cetera. It's what they do 
with that information that ultimately is where the rubber hits the road in terms of responsibility. I can give everybody listening in on this call a human rights policy, but that's not going to make the blindest bit of difference unless it's the right policy for you and you actually use it and adhere to it. So this is a case here where we're really trying to focus in on what are those output or those impact questions. With a big caveat, this word impact has lots of different meanings, which is why I put output in there as well. So a lot of us, we get tied in knots in terms of the terminology that we quite often see um, with regards to all of these frameworks and these standards. But the key thing with this is, well, what if we really did listen to one another? Um, and um, the, the picture that you can see on the screen in front of you actually comes from the output from a responsible investing conference that we ran with the Geological Society of London um, just under a year ago. And what you can see here is, okay, from a responsible investing perspective, what does that mean to national governments, international bodies, communities, the mining companies, etc.? What does that actually mean to them? What does their perspective look like? And this is important because if we're trying to work out for, say, an investor, which are the best organizations for them to invest in, from an investor perspective, they want to know if the investee, i.e. the mining company, is responsible now and for the long term. So they have the intent to carry on doing this good work for the long term. Meanwhile, the investee wants to prove that they are responsible in the simplest possible way. I'm sure Monica has worked with many different organizations over the last year or so where they are inundated by questionnaires from potential customers, investors, regulators, etc., all of whom are asking kind of the same questions, but a little bit different and different enough so that you can't just copy and paste. You have to sit there and dedicate the time to filling in yet another survey. And this is a problem because it takes time away from those individuals to actually get on and do their jobs, to actually get on and put in place those controls that are needed to make sure that we manage all of those different ESG risks on the ground. So the, 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 the aim that we're trying to get to here is what are those questions that we should all be asking that show true impact rather than box ticking? And this is perhaps some of the change that the, the industry is going through at the moment to say, what are the real questions that are going to have big impact that we can really focus in on to give us an indication of whether an asset is responsible or not? Now, the caveat with this is, of course, it changes depending on the context of that asset. And this could be where in the world is that asset? It could be what is the geographical location? It could be what stage is that asset at? Is it exploration or is it full-blown operation? Because there are some questions that you're just not going to know the answers to all the way back in the exploration stage. But exactly as Monica says, you need to be thinking about it and you need to be paving the way and creating the foundations and that cocoon in which the company can carry on working, acknowledging that the external context is constantly changing. So this is a case here to say, well, what if we did actually consider those projects all the way through? We weren't just looking to bring in the ESG aspects at the end of the project stage. We brought them all the way back to the beginning of exploration. And the exciting thing that is happening right now is only being kicked off recently is when we look at the resources and the reserve statements. And for those of you who want to know more about that, go and check out the webinar from last week in terms of what we mean by resources and reserves. What's happening now is that all of the different governance codes for reporting on how much rock is in the ground that can actually be extracted are now incorporating much more robust guidance and expectations with regards to ESG within them. And that's really exciting because by incorporating that governance into the rocks, it means that we draw all of that ESG right the way back to the beginning of exploration. And, and it means that we lay the foundations for foot proper ESG as we go through that operation. But it doesn't stop with the rocks, even though as a geologist, of course, I'd love it to. But also, what if all of those investors actually move towards that impact type space rather than box ticking space? in terms of ascertaining if an asset that they're looking to invest in or a company that they're looking to invest in is truly responsible. And what we're seeing here is a bit of a shift 
in terms of where those in investors are actually beginning to look and measure all of this. Now, they've been doing this for a long time, but the tools and the data that's available to those investors is getting much more mature and much more accessible. And this is a case here where, again, there are lots of different financial reporting metrics that are on their way at the moment, be it more on the regulation side or being it more on the business and accounting side. So this is really, really exciting. Also as well, we're seeing the setting up of various different routes into different governments. So for example, here we have the Critical Minerals Association, which was only founded at the beginning of this year, that provides that conduit into the British government from the mining sector and vice versa, which perhaps we haven't necessarily had in this format before. So what does this mean? It means that we're getting proper responsible mining onto the agenda, onto the table of those decision makers, together with the understanding that is required of those decision makers in order for them to be able to steer that guidance. Why do we do it? Well, I think Monica and I have made ourselves clear, perhaps through the course of the, the, last, the last 40 minutes or so, that if we can mine responsibly, not only does it reduce the total capital cost that is actually needed to produce that material, because it means we have fewer delays and fewer, fewer complexities, fewer surprises with regards to what we're doing, but it's also more attractive to those long-term investors who in turn, of course, are getting much more pressure put on them with regards to where they are investing at the moment. If we do it right, it's not just about stopping bad stuff from happening. It's also about seeing the benefits that local communities, for example, can gain from mining. And Monica articulated that beautifully in terms of the upside that we get from doing ESG properly, as well as, of course, the downside that we perhaps prevent. One of those aspects could be contributing to reducing that rich poor divide that we have in so many of those jurisdictions in which some of the world's richest mineral reserves are. And of course, it can form the likes of the foundation of that energy transition that we are all going through at the moment. How do we do it? Well, this is the big question. Okay, now we, haven't, we can't possibly explore all of the answers or all those potential answers um, in the next few minutes. But this is a case here of where one of the solutions is to be really, really, really good at viewing each asset through its own context. So understanding what is actually going on in that particular area and also what are, are the different risks both now and into the distant future that that particular asset or that particular jurisdiction might face. And with regards to those risks, this is my unashamed sell um, with regards to trying to encourage you to come along to next week's webinar, where we are going to look at risk management in the mining sector. How do you get risk management to be one of those tools to ensure that you can actually address all of those potential risks with regards to the environment, social and governance aspects, as well as everything else that you have to deal with when you're looking at mining. And this can be both from the miners perspective, but also from the perspective of everybody else who is interested or has a stake in the sector as a whole. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to, to hand back to our wonderful MC, Amon, so um, to, in case we have any questions, but also Amon, are, are there any other messages you would like to share with everybody? Right, well, thank you so much, uh, Sarah and Monica. Um, I, I'm actually, mining can lift humanity if we do it right. I think that's the statement that I'm gonna take away with me today. And if anybody asks me, why do you wanna work in mining? I'm gonna tell them that one. Because with all the negative press out there, especially at the moment, especially during you know these times of difficulties gosh mining can lift humanity what a profound statement so with that while sarah has a quick look at some of the questions that have come in through the q a button and we've also uh, got a few questions that have come in through the chat button we have a fabulous offer for you um it's a training course opportunity with Satarla. We, uh, they are offering discounts of up to 40% off to Women in Mining UK members. So please go to the member portal of the WIM UK website to view all the details and how to get in touch. And while Sarah takes a look at some of your questions, if you have a few more, please just, just add them to the Q&A button. We will try and answer as many as we can. And if we can't, gosh, you're just gonna have to come back next week. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much, Imoen. So, yeah, just while those questions are coming in, and um, and I know, Monica, there is a really good one for you that is loitering there in the Q&A that we'll post to you in a second. And um, we have, actually, ladies and gentlemen, had some of you sending in your um, your wonderful pictures. And I'm just going to switch over the screens now in the background whilst we're doing that. Um, and so some of your pictures here, um, so those are the ones I think we saw earlier on. And if I flick to the next one, um, you can see there's a whole variety of different pictures in terms of what do different people think a mine looks like. Um, some people, um, of course, think that there must be dinosaurs there, which is great. Everyone loves a dinosaur. Um, I suspect that this one up the top was probably drawn by an engineer because we've drawn it as a, as a flow chart, which is always fantastic. Um, if I just go back to the other slide here, um, yeah, I think this, this if I can, if I know where this one comes from, there is a note. This is the Mind of Moria, so we have, um, we have a, a fan of Tolkien, um, I think, in the room. This is fantastic. So what you can see here is it provides that different perspective of different people with regards to what, what do they think a mine looks like, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, so... With that, Monica, I'm going to come back to you and, and ask you um, some of the questions that have come in, if I may. So the first one um, has, has come in from Gladys and she says, um, I can feel that you really enjoy and feel for the people that you have worked with. There have been some big companies um, that have perhaps not been able to start projects because the community is opposed to it. Oppose it. Um, are there any specific reasons why you think this may have happened? Now, this is a vast question. Uh, but are there any key reasons why a community may initially oppose a big project? What do you think? Well, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you, Gladys. I think that you just put your finger where it is. Uh, let's start from two things. When any player, doesn't have to be a large company, buys an asset, um, in uh, obviously out of the jurisdiction they are, normally they do a due diligence. And this is where the industry have failed. The due diligence is legal, finance, and the social due diligence doesn't exist. I have done some social due diligence for companies who understand the bigger picture in terms of risk. Um, so when you don't do it, you just go by documents that prove that the deposit is very interesting, that is a great potential, and the company seems to have the documents in order, so they buy it. And happens that previous owners never took into account that community engagement piece, that responsible engagement component. So when you arrive, yes, legally, you have everything from the desk work is perfect, but the reality in the desk and the computer is not the same in the field. So many other times, uh, they had been really poor practices, or sometimes, as I mentioned before, let's say if you are operating in a country that has lived conflict, internal conflict, let's say the previous owners or the, the junior exploration, they did a great job, but it happens to be a very difficult country, you will find resistance. You will find resistance from local communities. And this is another piece of the puzzle that companies don't budget for social because it's a cost, it's not an investment. So if you think of the cost, you're gonna cut costs all the time and you're gonna cost, cut social all the time and surprise, you're cutting the cost of the only partner that can help you to dig on the ground. So you are cutting the head of the only miner that you have. So that's a bad idea. So thinking on that. So that's why most of the time, uh, companies, and I would say large, medium, any mid caps, they, they face uh, when, they, when they face that resistance. So you really need to know what you are buying. It's like ladies today oppose of uh, arranged weddings that happened in the past. It's nothing different than that. Today, we want to know who are we marrying rather than an arranged wedding that's surprise. So this is nothing different than that. It's exactly that. Great. Thanks, Monica. Um, there are a couple more questions. So one of them um, has come in from Maria Diaz and she says, 
um, you've worked at different mine sites um, across many different regions from regions, apologies, from Latin America, North America, Europe, etc. Mm -hmm. What are some of the key differences that you've noticed, be it on the environmental side or the social side, etc.? What are some of those key differences that, that you've seen between those different regions? I love that question because it's good to, to kind of, of find commonalities. I will start from commonalities and differences because the, dif the, the commonalities is that at the very core of human beings, we are, we are looking for the same. We are looking for a stability that equals uh, employability or a job or income that secures food on the table for our families. We want safety. It's very important, safety. We want to know that our kids can go to school and come back. We want to know that I go back to work and I come back and I'm safe. We want to know that we can walk out of our house for groceries and it's okay. It, we also look for the idea of, though we cannot manage the anxiety of the future, but we still, we want to know that my kids are gonna be okay tomorrow. Regardless, we cannot, we believe that the better we do today will save the path for our kids. All have no color, no, no region, no religion, no size, tall, short, fat, big. All of us, we are looking for stability, safety, and a better future. Or at least the idea that we can build a better future. Differences, this is the part that I love. It just comes in flavors because that's where color, uh, cultures are flavors. It's like everybody wants ice cream, but you prefer vanilla and I prefer chocolate. And that's the beauty of the world we have. The, the cultures and the approach to that is how every single culture approach safety, stability, and a better future. And differences, and, and in terms, now just go technical on the industry, it is interesting that, and I will just highlight a very good example in Latin America because it's gonna be very easy for everybody to see. When I call communities, community meetings, in Mexico, community meetings come the gentlemen older than 40. That's a community meeting. If I call community meeting in the Amazonia in Ecuador, I will have chickens, pigs, grandmamas, babies, pregnant women, everybody and the entire jungle comes to my meetings. And this is how culturally we organize ourselves as society. I, regardless of the fact that in Mexico, I was a little bit not very happy with the idea that I was the only woman in the room. I learned, happily I learned to be humble and recognize that I have to respect what their society and culture recognize as a decision makers. And that was me who had to adapt to the flavor of chocolate. I know vanilla in Mexico applies better because vanilla comes from Mexico. So with vanilla in Mexico means that Monica had to be meeting with only gentlemen. And I have my good partner that works with me all the time was actually most the boss. And many times I'll say, well, you're the secretary. I'm like, okay, I will take notes as long as we make this work. But that flavors actually de define how companies have to be very culturally sensitive on how you approach the industry and technical. For example, if the community is in Mexico and you're going to talk about water as being an area of impact, you know that you have to organize your community relations team to address water in, commu in community meetings with only women to address the women concerned and not get upset that men and women are gonna be in the same room and everybody gonna talk about water because we're gonna save and we're gonna cut the cost of having one meeting because it's gonna be much cheaper than having three meetings because we're cutting costs that means. No, that means that with women you have with conversation in Mexico and you will have one meter meeting with men leaders in the community. Uh, and that's when you bring that. That, so, that culturally sensitive and understanding is what make all the different flavors and the cultures in the world fascinating and the challenge in the approach. But understanding that all of us, we, ha we come from the same ground, it is the safest and actually helps a lot, the dialogue. Um, yeah. 
Thank you. Awesome, awesome answer, Monica. That's brilliant. And I think I can I see always, own... uh, Sarah always ended up with my analogies and I, I apologize because I talk too much to communities and never my, apologize, I Monica. Always, always <laughs> never apologize for your passion. <laughs> So, Monica, we've got one more quick question for you okay. before we, we wrap up. See, I'm unashamedly pushing all the questions to yourself, uh, but this is a good one, <laughs> and not that the others weren't good ones. So this one comes from uh, Norm Gridley, who I know is based in Santiago, Chile. Oh, um, nice. And he's asking, can you comment on any current experience with the difficulty of engaging with stakeholders, i.e. communities, neighbours, etc., during the time of covid especially with regards to social distancing, but also in those cases where perhaps not everybody has the same um, access to the internet, etc., as perhaps we're enjoying right this second. Do you have any hints or tips with regards to how to engage during this time of social isolation? Well, this goes back to our, our, uh, our webinar, Sarah. Yes, yes. I mean, I think that COVID, COVID just highlight the fact that the gaps between between uh, communities that have access to communications and not and it obviously it highlights the gap between rich and poor and the ability to that communities that can access uh, have access to even a, the very basic cell phone that you can send text messages you already have a lot in, in in advantage in front of you because you can send a message and around covid what the industry is doing is even since february i was i was working uh, with a with one of my biggest projects. Um, and since February, we start educating about what is COVID, but we didn't have any phone access. So we will send in communications and we use radio stations that in the local language. And we translated all the information about um, the coming from Ministry of Health and the World Health Organization. And we use the radio a lot. And radio, it is interesting that we sometimes we forget how important is radio and radio has connected us even in the second world war and that was funny enough i was thinking on how many people got connected and informed all the families around the radio exactly the same happening in communities that are locked in 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 areas that are very remote they have radio so use the radio and have messages in the in their local language and in the language of the country in this case was spanish and Chuar. Um, the other thing that happened that is that we found a lot is that in order to keep the communities isolated because that was the only thing we can help was to make sure that you go back to your baseline study and th and this is the piece that will differentiate a community that has a professional enga uh, community engagement uh, done already is because you have all the data in front of you you know how to access this community by by river, by road, by even walking distance, if it's the case. I'm talking about extreme areas. When you have all of this information, you can work in collaboration with local governments or even with national government, Ministry of Health, or so many times we will work with military because they were the only ones that have access to go on the roads and we use their tracks. And the messages we send by radio was kind of telling the communities we are sending food in order for you guys not to be out of your communities, in order to avoid any contact, in order to mitigate any, any risk of being contagious. And that, having that very strong, good baseline was to speed up the process. We will be, and just to, just to show an example, and I'm sure people are working on amazing programs, it also depends on when you know your community, what the community will need. So you will already know in, in, the, in this case that I'm describing, we knew that food will be the issue. In other cases, and, and also depends on the demographics. In, in our case, we have a very young population. So the risk in terms of contagious for elders was very, very low. But the risk of having these people coming to looking for food was the highest risk. So food, send food, keep them there. There are other areas where you have elders that you know that being close to medical assistance was critical and at the same time to be in a lockdown. So when you have all of these data, this data comes the answer. And I recommend that go to your data in order to read what can be done under COVID for the communities you're serving. I hope it helps. 
Brilliant. That's fantastic. Thank you very, very much, Monica. Um, Amon, back to yourself. Thank you so much to both Sarah and Monica and the team at Satarla for today's absolutely fabulous, inspirational webinar. Uh, Monica, when you know your community, you know um, that what your community needs. Well, from the community at Women in Mining UK, thank you very much for joining us. If you're ever in London, please look us up. For those of you who are interested in further training courses, please do feel free to go to the member portal of the WIM UK website to view all the details. And if this is your first time joining one of our events, Women in Mining UK is a volunteer run nonprofit organization which promotes the employment, retention and progress of women in the mining industry. Everyone is absolutely welcome to become a member of WIM UK, regardless of gender or where you are located in the world. Go to our website to join us now. Membership is free. Join us next Thursday, the 6th of August at 4 p.m. for the final part of this three-part webinar series where we will explore the world of risk management in the mining industry. Please remember the registration closes at noon the day before. Thank you again to all our speakers and participants for joining us today. Wishing you all a very wonderful rest of your afternoon, morning, wherever you are dialing in from the world. That's us out and goodbye.